secretly slimming. Should like should we just in terms of like base like tables of electricity? Uh, is that okay? Yeah. That, that I'm okay for the level screen. You can see my face. Yeah, sure. Enough. Otherwise, it's just the mics in front of my face. Like you know, I mean, why? Well, you know, if you don't want to capture all of this. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we are joined on turning pages by Elon Mastai. Thank you for having me. His new book is called All Our Wrongs Today's. You're a screenwriter first, yeah. novelist now. Um, I guess I want to start with kind of like what kind of uh, differentiation because like, I've I've seen scripts before. Yeah. Obviously, there's not a lot of interiority. Right. And yeah. I'm curious about kind of like going about writing a novel after you've been kind of trained in your brain to write a certain way. Yeah, and that was part of the appeal of writing a novel. Is I mean, with a screenplay, no matter what genre you're writing, whether you're writing a comedy or a horror movie or a historical epic, it's always the same writing style. It's always in the third person. It's always in the present tense. Um, it's you know a very visually dynamic way of writing, but it's also very lean. Mm -hmm. And you have, like you said, no interiority. You're always external to the characters. Uh, they're defined by their actions and their words, and sometimes the contradiction between those two things. Um, all of which I love as a writer. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, you sometimes it's not right for a certain story. At least I, when I came up with the idea for this story, um, in addition to kind of wanting the expansiveness of a novel, um, the idea of being able to write it from the perspective of the character in the first person is written as sort of a as a memoir. Um, and being able to tell the story not just um, about this character, but from this character's perspective, for better or for worse, you know, both the things that are important to them and also their blind spots of the character. That was really important to me. And I think I just also wanted to stretch some new muscles, you know. It feels like as a screenwriter, it's like you're always sprinting. And sometimes it's like you want to go for a swim. I like, I, I like using athletic metaphors. So right, I would just say like maybe be like, like long distance running versus yeah. sprinting, right? Like yeah. Like, yeah, it's just different, and, and and as a writer, you want to keep challenging yourself. You know, it's not like I think I have nothing to l learn as a as a screenwriter. I still do, uh, but I, I just really wanted to kind of push myself to a different kind of story. Yeah. What was the most difficult thing in terms of like maybe mechanics or or process wise mm -hmm. switching gears like that? Well, I mean, I think for a lot of young screenwriters, especially when you're going from doing short films to doing features, is that like how much story is a feature length? Story, you know, um, it's too much story. Is the, is the movie feel overstuffed or too long? Is it not enough where you have to sort of pad it out to feel like a feature? So after over a decade of being a screenwriter, like I have a pretty good handle on what's a feature length story. Right. That was, I think, on just like a big conceptual level. Was like how much story is a novel? I, I was, I, I was, am I going to like, you know, only get to like forty thousand words and my story's done, or is this enough to sustain? Um, not just in terms of how much story it's tell, but in terms of interest for the reader. And so. That was a big thing. Was just I'd never written anything on that scale before. Mm -hmm. um, and then just you know when you when you're writing a screenplay, of course, the, the upside of the limitations of the form and the stylistic sort of similarity is you know exactly how you're going to write it. Okay, no matter what my story is, third person, present tense, lean style, external perspective on the character. So when you're writing a novel, then you have the flip side of it, which is where you can do anything. And if you could do anything, how do you decide? Right. And so I. I, that was a process, too, of figuring out not just how to tell this story, but um, literally how to tell it. Like, what are the best, what are the literary techniques that are going to be best for this particular narrative? And you, you play with some of those techniques. Yeah. Right? Like, right off the hop, I think it's the second chapter, you start writing in the third person. And then you're like, whoa, 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 hold on. Let me put the brakes on this, right? Yeah. That sort of, like, knowingness of the character, was that something in, like, cooked into the character from the get-go that they kind of... Because they'd experienced this like outside of time experience, mm -hmm. they were removed enough from the situation in some sense to write about it. Yeah, and I, I like the idea of the character grappling with how to tell his story as well. So yeah, in chapter at the end of chapter one, um, I'm not giving anything away because it's the beginning of the book. I'm gonna say, it, like, it's written in the first you person. You glance at this in the, in the bookstore. You yeah, know? you'll know this. And then at the end of the chapter, he's like, oh, you know, maybe first person isn't the right way. Maybe I should try the third person, and then that doesn't work, and he goes back to the first person. And part of that was, I thought it was a fun way of, of putting the, the reader in the headspace of a character who has a story that they're compelled to tell, but they're trying to figure out how to tell it, what the best way to tell it is. And I thought it was endearing and also interesting. Um, and at the same time, you know, working as a, so I work as a screenwriter primarily, and I've worked in both the independent system in Canada and also in the Hollywood system in the U.S. And in the Hollywood system, more so in Canada, like a lot of your work is like you get hired on gigs, right? Like someone has a project. Or something. Yeah. Like and so... You end up having to figure out what it is about the story that you can make personal to make it work 
telling. So it's not just some hack job or, or like you don't have a mercenary perspective on it. Um, and so one of the things that I found that I do is um, every project has its challenges and obstacles. And I like to, whatever it is for a given project, I like to give those same challenges and obstacles to the protagonist. So whatever I'm working through as a writer, I find a sort of a way of having the protagonist have the same problem. Like a mirror. Exactly. And sometimes it's a little more veiled, sometimes it's a little more direct. And so, like, as a screenwriter learning to write his first novel and figuring out how to do that, I also gave that question to my character in a more existential way. How He's I, trying to figure out how to tell how a story. story. Yeah, and so that was a way of making um, even something even something like that um, sort of personal. Right. And you even play with some form in terms of 40 chapters in, there's a synopsis of this chapter that you've read. I mean, obviously, further down the road, you understand why. Yeah. But I think that was like the first time I've ever read a novel where it gives it a synopsis of like the yeah. like it felt like like a previously on like yeah the, the big, like a bumper on like a television like an episodic television show. yeah and I, I I liked that when you get to that first synopsis that's what it feels like it's like previously on like you almost feel like oh it's like a, I'm binge watching a television series and there's a little little catch up mm-hmm. um, and I liked it because a lot happens in the first hundred pages and so it's kind of it's sort of nice to be like oh okay well I know a lot happened but actually. This is the main stuff that happened that we need to know. But then, my job as a writer is later on, oh, actually you find out that's there for a whole other reason. And so, my job is to keep surprising you. Yeah. And and I, I, I sometimes the surprise is a plot twist. Sometimes it's something funny. Sometimes it's something sort of surprisingly emotional. And sometimes it's sort of like a metatextual thing like that, which sort of hopefully throws you just a little bit off balance, but keeps you interested in what's going to happen next. Right. So, speaking of binge watching, like the, the chapters are all short, yeah. right? And I'm curious if that's like it's like a binge type like impetus, right? Like that you're prompting the reader to be like, oh, just a, just a little more, just a little more. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of saw it um, in two ways. One, everybody's super busy. We lead really hectic lives, and I like the idea of um, even just each little chapter just gives you a little piece of the story and should hopefully still have a beginning, middle, and end and be satisfying, even if it's only like three pages long. I like that idea that you can kind of pick up the book and read it a little bit at a time if that's what your life is like. Or if you have the time to read chapter after chapter after chapter, you can do that as well. And yeah, I mean, each chapter does kind of hook into the next one. So that, I, I like it because it keeps you turning pages. Uh, even though as a screenwriter, you use white space on the page a lot in a way that you don't always get to in a novel. Mm-hmm. And so I like the idea of just using chapter breaks to get you to keep turning the pages. It's sort of like a way of making it, um, uh, compo- it's like uh, you know, getting a big plate of nachos. Like you, you, you could just eat one. Do you? Well, it feels almost like the uh, like when something on Netflix and the Netflix right. says like in, starting in ten seconds or yeah. whatever, right? Like it just prods your yeah, or an old school like the commercial break, right? Like the the last the last moment of a television show before they break the commercial, they always want to keep you hooked, so you stick around. Yeah, I like that kind of writing. I mean, it it's maybe a slightly funny comparison, but when I was growing up, one of my favorite things was Tintin. You know, the old yep. Tintin, and of course, growing up, you know, like in the eighties, like we bought them into books, right? But one of the things I discovered was, so Tintin was originally published one page at a time. It's, it's serialized in the yeah, paper. Yeah, every week, there'd have to be one page. Yeah. And so every every page of Tintin ends on a cliffhanger, because he wanted you to come back next week. And so it makes you keep turning the pages, because each last panel sort of leads to whatever's on the next page. And I always liked that storytelling technique as well. Um, I, I figured my job as a writer is to satisfy you one page at a time, but to get you to keep reading. Right. So technique-wise, like, did you... Sussing out, like you've got your story, right? Like the, the idea of what the narrative is, but then you also have to kind of figure out how to tell it. Yeah. Like, were they like married? Like, was it, did the two things occur at the same time, or did you kind of like plot it out and then kind of figure out how you're going to tell that plot? Oh, that's an interesting question. I mean, I did definitely plot it out ahead of time. It's a, you know, there's a lot of complexity with storytelling, there's a lot of big plot turns and big time travel and alternate realities. Um, and so, yeah, I did plan it all out beforehand, and then I, I thought about what the best way to tell the story uh, and what's sort of the appropriate form for the story. And then, of course, there is a give and take. Sometimes the form of the story ends up um, uh, informing how you're telling the story. I mean, the other thing about the short chapters is it does, I thought, reflect um, the way our memory works, the way our attention spans work. Um, It's not this long, languidly paced thing. It's like quickly paced, and it's short bursts. And I think it probably does get a little bit getting used to, but my hope is that the, you know, the way the story's told, the narrative voice sort of eases you in, right? And so I, I like the short chapters not just um, because of the pacing that they provide, but also because of the insight into the character's mind that they provide. 
Yeah, I think so long as it's you know uniform to itself, like yeah. that kind of style, like you, you get used to it, right? Like I think about something like Jose Saramago, who doesn't use punctuation, right? And I use punctuation. It's yeah. jarring at first, <laughs> but then yeah. once you get into the rhythm of that writer, yeah, like you, you get it as a reader. And I, I mean, yeah, obviously I'm on, on a different track. This is he's, you can compare me to Saramago. There you go. Yeah. But, you know. yeah. Um, yeah, and I mean, again, like it's not like the chapters are like half a page. Like no. they're still, you know, no. you still get like a, you know, they're just not like really long. Um, yeah, I think it's like, to me, it's like I come up with this, the way that my mind tends to work is I'll come up with like a premise mm -hmm. and then I'll spend a lot of time thinking about who's the most interesting character for this premise to happen to. Like who, what's our way in? And so then I spend a lot of time thinking about characters, not just the lead character, but the people around them as well. Mm -hmm. And then once I have the premise and also not just what happens, but who it's happening to, then I spend a lot of time thinking about form and like how to tell the story. Um, in a screenplay, that might just be sort of like storytelling structure. It's not necessarily going to be literary technique. Mm -hmm. In a book, it's not just storytelling structure. It's also literary technique. Right. So character. Yeah. Uh, you, you thought of like sort of central characters, but uh, there's also like other versions of those characters. Yeah. Right? Uh, without giving too much away, like the initial thing is like someone travels back in time and mm -hmm. then as, as a result of that like disrupts sort of what was meant to happen and then yeah. it ends up being kind of like a different version of them. Yeah, I like the idea, and again, without trying to give too much of, of the plot away, that what if our world, what we think of as the real world, what if this is actually a dystopia caused by an accident? This wasn't the way it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. We all think this is the way it's supposed to be because this is the only this version of reality know. is what we know, but what if, what if it wasn't? What if this isn't how it was supposed to be? And a protagonist who comes from that other version of the world gets stranded here, uh, and it's kind of mostly horrified, at least at first, by what he finds, and then, as he peels back the layers, starts to discover, you know, it's a much more complicated than that. Um, yeah, I, I, that's part of the fun, is I, I knew I knew that I wanted to take both the reader and my character on a real journey. Like, he's a very, very different person in the beginning of the book than he is at the end of the book. That was intentional. So I thought about how, who I wanted him to be at the end of the book, and then start him as far away as possible from that in the beginning, so that it's a real process. And then my job as a writer is to get Point A to point B in a way that feels um, both psychologically real and also just like interesting from a storytelling perspective. Because if it's psychologically real but boring, no, who cares, right? So finding the, mar the marriage of that, keeping it as entertaining as possible, but still telling a story about somebody who makes a lot of bad decisions, goes through a lot of tough, tough experiences in his life, and gets out on the other end, you know, a, a more grounded and whole person than he was when he started. Right. You mentioned complexity earlier, and I wanted to talk about kind of the complexity of a simple idea. Right. Right, like this is the simple idea is someone goes back in time and messes with the timeline, right? But then the complexity of you as the author creating the believable world that should have happened, the the, the way in which he messes up the current timeline and then like unintended consequence. Like how much thinking did you <laughs> have to do ahead of time about like world building when it came yeah. to this? Because on the on the face of it it seems like a really like simple premise, but right when you get into the nuts and bolts of like crafting this other world, yeah, messing that world up, <laughs> and then like, you know, yeah. how to interweave. Um, yeah, I mean, I did a lot of thinking about it. Um, uh, I mean, I would answer that question in two ways. Um, I feel like I say that a lot. Uh, on the one hand, you know, my interest since I was, I, I've been interested in this stuff since I was a kid. You know, my grandfather had this really extensive collection of old 50s and 60s pulp sci-fi that I loved when I was growing up. You mentioned that in the acknowledgments. Yeah. It's basically like the, the collection that your dad has in the contemporary timeline. Right. It used to be your grandfather's book. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, uh, but even, and I love the stories, I love the covers with these like, you know, futuristic cities and robots and you know, adventurers and uh, spaceships. But even as a kid in the 80s, I was aware that like the future wasn't turning out the way these writers and artists in the 50s and 60s imagined it would. And I was very interested in that disconnect. At the same time, I was really fascinated by sci-fi. I was fascinated by that idea of the future we were supposed to have versus the one we were getting. Mm -hmm. And so, on one level, writing about this sort of all, this utopian version of the present, not the future, but the right now, yeah. the 2016, 2017, that people in the 50s thought we were going to have. I've been thinking about that stuff since I was a kid, and so part of writing that version of the world is like taking all of that adolescent imagination and then finding a more mature, grown-up way of telling that story. Um, so it's kind of like a, a, an accumulation of details that I thought about for years. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, when you're writing this kind of stuff, you, I mean, there was a certain amount of, of planning that goes in, but I also just think about, like, what's interesting to me, you know? I mean, that, that's, uh, I, I just try to put myself in the, in the reader's 
time. Because you know, I thought about it a lot more than I actually put in the book. Like I could go on and on about it, but I, I'm. It's it, there's you have to be judicious and disciplined, even even with as much space as you have as a novel. Because I'm every step of the way, I'm like, is this pushing the story forward? Is this just a? a, a I never want to put details in there, just like, just, oh, look how smart I am, or look how creative I am. Like, I mean, obviously, it's nice if people think the book is smart and creative, but my job is to keep pushing the story forward. So it's only the details that are going to push it forward, make the world feel textured and real, and be interesting. Like, to me, it's like, is this interesting? If it's not, forget it. Um, and if it is if it is interesting and sort of illuminates something, not just about the story, but really about the character, then it's worth putting in there. So it's a balance. Right. I mean, I guess this is kind of like the, there's like a fine line to tread between making it believable enough and then just like so hyper real that it's like over <laughs> overwhelming in terms of detail. Like, yeah. I mean, I don't know why. It's mind, but like George Lucas, you know, mm. went back and tried to like add details right. to the world and that like those extraneous things kind of like sullied it in some way, right? Like yeah. there's like a leanness or an economy that at a certain point people believe and then when you go too descriptive it's right. bogged down. Yeah, you don't want to be bogged down. That's, that's exactly right. Like, it's funny. When, so when I was a teenager, I remember I went through a phase like a lot of teenagers maybe nerdy teenagers do, where I was like into um, uh, like art role playing games, right? Mm -hmm. And then I was like, I'm going to come up with my own role playing game. And I spent like weeks and weeks and weeks working on all the details of the world and building this whole thing. And I had this whole folder. But I, I, I and then I, I uh, got my friends together and I was like, I'm gonna, we're going to play the role playing game that I created. And I forgot about the one thing, which is like, it should be fun and it should be playable. And basically, like everybody died within about 20 minutes. And they were like, it wasn't really that fun. And I was like, no, but I have all these details. And, and but it was like it was too much. I spent all this time thinking about it, and not enough time thinking about like why would it be fun to play. And so that was like a really great early like teenage learning experience that like all the, all your creative details only matter if it's fun to play. Okay, so this brings to mind one of the quotes I highlighted in the book, which is when you invent the train, you also invent the derailment. Right, right. The like unintended consequence, or like really it's like the dark underside of yeah either the technology, the idea. It sounds like you know, like you invented this RPG <laughs> without thinking about like, is it fun, right? Like, yeah, and yeah. So the idea that I talk about in the book is, is the accident, right? Whenever at that idea, like whenever you you invent the car, you also simultaneously invent the okay. car crash, right? There's no such thing as a plane crash until you invent the plane. And I'm fascinated not just by the intentional aspects of technology, but the unintentional ones. I mean, you know, big conversation we're having in our culture right now is like the internet. You know, this incredible resource where all of human knowledge is available in the click of a button, but it has this unintended consequence that all information becomes equal. Fact and fiction become conflated. You can like decide what you think of is true. And so this is like the, the unintended consequence of this technology, and we can see the profound effect that it's having on our culture. Um, and so I think that that stuff is very interesting, not just in terms of technology, but the people. How, you know, each piece of technology is usually invented to solve a problem. But in that, almost every kind of technology that I can think of causes some other problem that wasn't what that wasn't what they intended. They probably didn't even think about it. But um, you, you don't introduce any kind of like transformative technology without also introducing the unintended consequences. Sometimes, some of which can be much worse. Because you know, you think about it, the unintended consequence of the car isn't just the car crash, as terrible as it can be, and the loss of life and all that sort of stuff that comes with a car crash. It's also like urban sprawl, climate change. These are all things that, that are the accidents of, uh, oh, you know what would be great is if we could have something a little faster than a horse. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That sort of like notion of the, the, the consequence, uh, the future, that, or well, rather, like the alternate present yeah. that uh, you posit, you know, there is an unlimited amount of energy until they've got right range, right? Yeah. I, I say contrider, but I mean, it's, it's not, it's, it doesn't matter. But sure enough. But basically, like, any need for energy has been solved, right? Mm -hmm. So all of the industry around that disappears, all the, yeah. like, need disappears. And so the, the world is much more focused on, you know, creating entertainment and other, like, avenues of sort of artistic pursuit and stuff like that. And I'm curious about, like, when you're, when you're creating this world, like you said, mm -hmm. you, you know, started thinking about this as, as a kid reading these sci-fi novels. Thinking about this sort of like techno utopia where you know energy is not an issue, the consequence then of maybe like on on the lead, like it, mm -hmm. like he seems adrift because that's yeah. you know not necessarily something that's fulfilling to him. Well, I thought about the idea of um, what happens in a world uh, where everything's taken care of for you. For you. you know, literally, if you make a mess, like a robot maybe will hover over and clean it up for you, right? Yeah. And 
most of the people in Tom's world, like they like they're actually like they're quite ambitious and, and successful. And he's not. He's sort of an outlier. Like he's and part of that is personal because he has this incredibly successful inventor father and sort of like, you know, I don't know what Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or Elon Musk's kids feel like, but it's hard when you have you know, I, I like the idea that he just <clears throat> because his father is so successful, he says like he'll never match up to him, so why even try? And then on a social level, there's that thing of like if you don't have to take if you have, technology solves all of your problems, if you don't have to take responsibility for anything, like what does that do to you? And so I thought he was an interesting combination of like sort of personal ennui, but also like a, a sort of like a more cultural level of, of sort of irresponsibility. Um, uh, I think it, it's for, for characters that don't have the familial issue, maybe it's not as, as, as stark, but like you see it in his interactions with his friends, with the women in his life, with the other jobs he has before he sort of like reluctantly takes a job with his father, um, that he's just like, he, he doesn't even, he doesn't quite fit into, despite how extraordinary this world is, he doesn't quite fit into it. There's something, and it's only when he lands in our messy, chaotic, version of reality, you know, for him, ironically, he, he actually fits a lot better here. Um, and so he is a sort of a, a man out of time, even when he's in his own real time. So going back to the idea of mirroring that, so the, the Tom from the, the alternate present mm -hmm. goes back, messes things up, ends up in armor. There was a, a version of him yeah. who I would say maybe didn't quite belong in his own timeline, right? Like, did yeah. you think of it in, like, did yeah, you build so it into the, like, the the inverse? Yeah, those kind of parallels. Like, in fact, the version of him from our world probably would have, would have fit much better into, into Tom's world. And of course, as the, you know, as the book progresses, we start to peel back those layers, right? And we sort of see that the connections between the worlds uh, that have existed, that they that neither of them were aware of. And, you know, one of the things I really, like, I love time travel stories. I think they're super fun. I'm a total nerd for them. I like them. But one of the things that sort of a pet peeve about time travel, it's not just that the stories often just disregard the science, because the science is very interesting. And so what I did try to do in this book is like dig into the science without being overwhelming. There's not a lot of math or anything, but right. I tried to dig into the science. Um, but I also, time travel is always so clean. Even the consequences of time travel are clean. You know, you make a change, it changes something else, and we make another change, oh, it changes something else. But it's always very like cause and effect. And, it, and, and time travel itself, it's always like you just wink out of, Existence and you appear in another time, but what? But something as momentous as time travel, I feel like it should be. Why shouldn't it be the hardest thing you've ever experienced? Why shouldn't it be messy and complicated? I mean, time uh, is this is one of, is like it's the fundament of our existence, and so reversing the flow of it should should be momentous and complex and uh, uncontrollable. And so I kind of wanted, to, I really wanted to embrace that and explore like a lot of different possibilities. And one of them is what it does to his identity. And the connections between the two timelines. Again, like I never wanted it to be. I didn't want to. You don't want to lose the off the reader by being so convoluted. So I wanted it to all be very like be, in the moment, like make sense, but to open up a lot of these kind of questions. And yeah, for Tom, it's like he's unhappy in his version of the world, and it, and it, and there's so much plenty that it, it's. And he even knows this about himself. It's like, what am I complaining about? But he just doesn't fit, you know. Um, but I think there's a lot of people who feel that way about our world. You know, like you might grow up in. Canada and have all these freedom and stuff. It's not like people don't have class issues or, you know, whatever their background issues. I mean, people have real psychological problems. Everybody's got problems. But we live in a world, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a society of plenty compared to a lot of places around the world. And yet there's lots of people who can't find their place, who, are, who, who feel like this isn't their world, who have issues. And, and, they're, and so I, I wanted to write a, a character like that. It's an accelerated version of us. Um, and, but then I want to start peeling away all the things about his life, you know, peel away the technology, peel away the plenty, peel away everything, what's at your core. But I also like the idea of, as he peels away all these layers, what he discovers is that, what, what if you discover, so like we assume that if we peel everything away, our core is still good, right? But what if when you peel things away, your core isn't that good? What if those layers are there for a reason? Right, that you've kind of built some firewalls or something, right? Like, yeah, yeah, and that's what I liked about it. Like when he, the, the version of himself he discovers here at first seems much more impressive. Like, he's like, oh, he's accomplished all this stuff, all the success that was denied me. And Tom would say, because of his father, he's become a much more successful version of himself. But then as he gets to know this version of himself, darker things emerge. And not just his arrogance and detachment, but but it's like success has turned him into a kind of person that he, that at first just throws, throws him off base, but then becomes actually more sinister, right? And I like that idea of, 
I mean, I don't know what it says about me as a writer, that like success doesn't seem to make people better. It seems to make them worse. But I, I wanted a character who aspires to all this stuff, and when he discovers it, it, it realizes, oh, just like success messed up my father, and I blamed him for my own lack of success, but when I do reach success, look what it does to me. Mm-hmm. It's like absolute power corrupts absolute. Yeah, and right. even a little bit of power corrupts a little, a little bit. Yeah. The, the time travel thing, like you said, you know, a lot of like the butterfly effect type stuff, it, it, it does like get presented as a very simple thing, but one of the things that I found interesting that I don't think I've ever read before in, in sort of the sci-fi is the recognition that you're not just traveling in time, you're traveling in space, right? That the Earth is rotating and then, like, on a daily basis, and then the Earth is also moving in the solar system, yeah, right? And that if you move back in time, you could end up in, like, the darkness of space if you stayed in the exact same spot, right? And so yeah. this notion of, like, having to like, long-range, like, pin it to another point in time where you know where the Earth is and where an exact spot is, yeah. you know, like, manifest in a wall. Uh, where, where did that come from? It, you know, since I was a kid, I was fascinated by the idea. Again, so this stuff sort of, like, goes to my childhood. Just that idea that here we are, we're sitting in this room, and we feel like we're stationary. But, of course, that's actually about the limits of human perception. We're actually we're spinning around at, like, hundreds of miles an hour while orbiting the sun at tens of thousands of miles an hour. Well, the sun is actually moving at, like, billions of miles an hour. And that incredible velocity is lost on us because we can't, we don't perceive it. That's how our brains are built. And I just thought that was fascinating. I, remember I used to just, like, you know, lie in the grass and think about that idea that I'm actually hurtling through space. And so... It's something that always bothered me about time travel is that, you know, most models of time travel that I'd ever read, they act as if you just open a door in time and you walk through and you're in the same place. It's this sort of like we, like, despite all the sophistication of our world, it's this like pre-Copernican idea of the earth as the center and everything spinning around us. But of course we know it's not true. Mm -hmm. So I like the idea of thinking, you know, if we were to travel back in time to yesterday, we wouldn't land, we wouldn't be in Winnipeg. We would be literally in an empty vacuum of space with the earth tens of thousands of miles away from us. And so I, I wanted to think about a model of time travel that recognized that you're not just traveling back in time, you're traveling back in space, and not a short distance, literally tens, hundreds of thousands of miles, millions of miles, and, and how you would model time travel to make that work in a way that would be believable, again, without burdening the reader with like crazy like graphs and like calculations. I like thinking about that stuff, and, 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 and because when you think about that stuff, it leads to other ideas, like that idea of, of the Earth spinning, led to this idea of this clean energy that, that that's developed by harnessing that rotation of the earth. And once I and I had that idea and, and, and it sort of dovetailed with my just general like that question I've had since I was a kid, like what happened to the world, future we were supposed to have? What went wrong? Why why did why didn't I get a jetpack for my twelfth birthday, you know? And there's lots of answers obviously, but the, if you could boil it down to one thing, it's fuel, you know, power. I mean there's obviously like political power and economic power, but I mean literally power. You know I mean, regardless of what your environmental beliefs are, I mean, uh, the, the problem with fossil fuels, putting aside all environmental questions and the, the catastrophic results of them, is that they're actually not very efficient, right? Like, burning coal... The amount of energy it takes to, like, frack. Right. It, it's not efficient, and, and it doesn't provide enough energy to actually do any... Like, most of the limitations we have are limitations of fuel. Why don't we have jetpacks? Because, uh, because putting a giant container of, like, jet fuel on your back is very dangerous. Right, and so I thought, well, if I could come up with a kind of fuel that uh, would be clean and robust, um, it, you know, and and that that discovery might have happened fifty years ago instead of now, how different our world would have been. Um, and 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 so I find like when you start to think about this technology and the, the real science, so if you want to develop a model of time travel that actually factors in orbital mechanics, it, it just that simple question led to all these other parts of the world building. And so that's what I like about taking the science seriously. Not that you need to burden the reader with it, but that it opens up all these fascinating possibilities. Right. So, I mean, ultimately you end up with kind of like three timelines. Right. Did you imagine other timelines as well? Like, just... Yeah, I did, but I, 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 I did. And I think there's lots of writers who've written terrific books exploring like the multiverse theory. I, it just That wasn't what I was interested in. I, yeah. I, I, I like the idea, first of all, of, like, of a parallel between a utopian version of the present and a dystopian, what's well, perceived at first to be a dystopian version, and then of course, then the realization, oh, like what the protagonist thinks of, what we think of as the real world, the protagonist thinks of as dystopia, but there's also a much worse possibility out there, 
and you know, now I don't want to get into too many spoilers, yeah. but that idea um, that uh, it could always be worse, and that sense that we all have, which is you know, none of us, none of us end up with the future we thought we were going to have, right? Mm -hmm. And you can either focus on your regret for how you got here, or all the things that are wrong with the world, or you can embrace the chaos and mess of real life, because there are worse alternatives out there. And that's what my protagonist has to grapple with, which is like, um, what you know, like it, maybe it's not as good as he thought it was, but it could also be a lot worse. Right. There's like the idea that things could be better. There's the idea that things could be worse, and then I think maybe the like being topic of clarity maybe leads to some inertia, right? Like I think yep. that that's where Tom kind of gets. Some that's right. Look, I mean, we all we have like we don't live in a world where technology has solved all of our problems. Uh, we live in a world where we have a lot of problems, but I mean, we see this happening in our political culture every single day, which is that. If you pretend like our problems have easy solutions, these are black and white issues, you don't solve anything. In fact, you make everything worse. It's only by embracing complexity that you can actually even start to solve our problems. Um, and Tom comes from a utopian world where things do seem black and white. Technology has solved everything. And so he, he, even though he has a comp complex internal life, um, it takes, it takes a waking up in our world for him to realize how, how complicated things are. And that can be overwhelming at first. But part of the, part of being a grown up is recognizing that stuff, and fundamentally, like this is kind of a story about somebody who who he comes from a world where you don't have to be a grown up, and he and he's forced to to grow up. In our modern world, Tom embraces the gray, and this yeah. is why he works as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, on another level, like um, you know, not to get overly personal, but you know, my mom, uh, my mother passed away uh, about sixteen years ago. I was I was uh, I was twenty six when that happened, and. I was interested in looking back at that time and writing about what that experience was like from, I mean, obviously I'm like, it's a story with like lots of big plot twists and time machines and alternate realities. But I was also interested in, in, in that idea of, you know, when you lose a loved one, whether it's a parent, whether it's a spouse, a sibling, just even a close friend, somebody who feels essential to you, um, you go through a period of disorientation. It's like you have to figure out who you are again, you know? And that idea of, before and after, uh, sort of like, you know, we all sort of suddenly look back on um, the period before the loss and then the period after, and it, it can feel very strong. Uh, and so I, I was also interested in exploring somebody who goes through, because Tom, and this is very early in the book, Tom goes through the loss of his mother, and it's quite sudden. And a lot of the bad decisions and kind of like, um, sort of like, uh, the un un his instability comes after that. And I was interested in exploring that idea as well, of like, how you figure out who you are in the wake of a profound loss. Right, you have someone who's an anchor point, and then now you're unmoored. Yeah, and he becomes unmoored, but literally in time, and, you know. Yeah. And that that was, that again, like, I mean, I, 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 could, I suppose I could have written that story as sort of like a sad, um, you know, sort of a, as a sad memoir. That's not my personality. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I, as much as I love thinking about technology and utopia and dystopia, and I love just as a storyteller, I like plot twists that like shocking and surprising the reader. I wanted to ground it in something that, um, something sort of s relatable but serious and emotional because uh, you, you, otherwise the character feels glib. You know, I, I wanted him to have that, like you said, that anchor. Um, that he is anchored in, in not just a grief, but like a very disorienting, a very, sh like he's, in a lot of ways, he's kind of like, he's in shock mm -hmm. and he starts making a lot of bad decisions. And I remember that time in my life and, and that sense of like, you almost can't trust your own judgment because when something happens that seems so unbelievable, like just as essential as losing a parent, it does throw you into disarray and it takes a while to find your balance again. I'd like to say you didn't want it to be like a very sad, no, I mean, sort of like pseudo memoir. Uh, ultimately, I, I do want to stress that folks who read them, you know, this gets into some pretty complex stuff, but it's a funny book. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? I mean, it's great to sit here and talk about sort of the themes of it, but no, I it's yeah, the book is the book is pretty funny and very it's. it's very quick paced, and uh, I mean, it's no. I wanted to write something that was like super, super entertaining, but I mean, we're, we're talking about it from the perspective of, of I wrote the book and you read the whole book. So yeah. I mean, I wanted a story that was like very, very funny, very fun, very interesting, very page turning. But then there is this accumulation of details that hopefully um, it, it gives it some some sort of like uh, uh, emotional weight and sort of um, philosophical weight as it progresses. Right. So I mean, having experience as a screenwriter writing this novel. I am adapting it. Yeah. We sold the movie rights to Paramount. Okay. So uh, Paramount felt like uh, uh, that there could be a great movie in there. So, I, so I'm so i now writing the movie version of the book. So then 
recontextualizing something <laughs> you've already thought through process wise yeah. into a third person. Into yes. you know it's weird. Yeah. Yeah. I mean uh, when they wanted to buy the rights and they wanted to make you know they wanted me to write it, I, I obviously haven't worked as a screenwriter for many years because that's been my main career. Um, I was like, no, that's a, it'll be a challenge if it'll be a good challenge, but it is. It's it's on the one hand, like I have the comfort and, and sort of the privilege of knowing, oh well, like I got to write the book, I got to write the story that way, and so it's not like um, you know all copies of the book will be birthed. Like we could just read the full story, you know. Hopefully, yeah. I mean, we'll see if you know. If Trump manages to make books illegal, but so far in Canada we're yeah, okay. Yeah. People can like you know uh, sneak across the border to come to our bookstores. Um, but uh, the uh, that sounds like a uh, that's that's like a pulp side that novel. Just, that's it's a, like a yeah. different novel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, uh, yeah, I mean the chance to reimagine the story from the outside, from an exterior perspective of a character, to compress a lot of it, to reimagine certain things. When I wrote the book, I wanted to just embrace all the things that, that books do well. And so for the movie, it's different. It's like you're embracing all the things movies do well. So you don't have the interiority of the character. Show, don't tell. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you have this visual dynamism. You have a kind of like a kinetic, propulsive pace to it. You, you can, you know, yes, you don't have the uh, interior world of the character, but you have the actor's faces, you know. You can depict things visually um, uh, in a really, like, uh, compelling way. And so I'm just trying to embrace what I can do with the movie to tell a different story. Just, like screenplay is like ninety pages, something like that. Is kind of. A... I mean, you know, it's a book. It'll probably, yeah. I mean, it'll probably be more like 110, 120 pages. But yeah, I mean, it's a lot shorter. Yeah, yeah. A typical screenplay is somewhere around twenty thousand to twenty five thousand words. You know, novels like this novel's like ninety six or ninety seven thousand words, so it's more. So there's definitely a compression that happens. You got to give up a lot. Um, at the same time, you, you gain certain things too. Right? Well, the book is all around today. You know, on that side, thanks very much for coming in and sitting down. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me.